Alrighty, welcome to the Calvin Miller Podcast. I have, uh, you know, another, you know, just another brother man. You may know him. His name is Dr. Ron E. Glass. The second time on the podcast, but he's coming through to really talk about the amazing research that he's doing. If you know Dr. Ron E. Glass, he is a PhD in ethical mathematics. Um, he has one of the best TED Talks you could probably uh, know of, but he studies science and culture. And he's trying to get us to, we want to get out of his top down mindset. We want to get into more bottom up mindset where we are co-generating, we're coming back. Everything we take apart, we bring it back. Everything we take out, we bring it back. We're not just extracting. And Ron wants to give you, you know what I'm saying, just some more just some more sustainable ideas on how we can save the planet. We're going to talk about biodiversity today. We're going to talk about his research. We're going to talk about the Ukraine war and how those things relate. But let's go ahead and just introduce Ron, man. How you doing, man? Good, good. How are you? I'm happy you back on, oh, man. I, I was a little worried. I thought you were going to be like, hey, Calvin, man, this is like the fifth cancellation you've done. <laughs> I don't know, man. You know, well, you might I have understand. to talk to my I, assistant. I, get it. <laughs> I totally get it. I totally get it. Hey, man, you're All the right. most down to earth um, ever. Thank you so much. But go ahead, brother, man. Thank you so much. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. Oh, of course. All right. I mean it. I mean so, it. So, so uh, I'm at the School of Information. Um, yep. at the University of Michigan. Um, and so justice comes up a lot. Um, but I'm a little bit disappointed with how it keeps focusing on this idea of algorithmic bias, right? Yep. Um, so folks in my field want to go into this machine learning, AI, algorithms, and make sure that it, it's not biased, you know, so that only white folks get the good deal on, on housing or something like that. And I'm totally in agreement that that work is necessary. It definitely needs to happen. But if that's if that's the narrow little box that you're fitting yourself in, there's a danger there that mm. you're just going to end up reinforcing our current system. How right? so? How so? Real quick. How I'll, so? I'll give you an I'll give you an example of that. So there was all this outcry about facial recognition systems that were not able to identify black faces as well as white faces. Um, and, you know, I, I, I agree that needs to be fixed, right? But what happens once you have that perfected facial recognition system, it's going to go into law enforcement. It's going to go into mm. incarceration systems, mm. right? And so it's going to better enable the cops to arrest black folks. So it's not as though fixing the bias is actually getting at the source of the problem. And the same thing with housing discrimination. So it's true. There's redlining where, where right. you know, depending on who you are, you'll get a better deal on your mortgage. Right. But once you once you fix those algorithms, so it's now giving everybody a fair shake. It's not as though poor people can now afford houses. And if you if you look at what happens with rent and defaulting on mortgages, that's a major source of financial instability in the black community. Right. The same thing with prisons. So yeah, we should fix those algorithms that end up giving, you know, a, a white person who gets arrested gets 10 years and a, the black person for the same crime gets 20 years. That's really bad. But, you know, once you fix that, you still have this problem with what Angela Davis called the, the prison industrial complex. The United States has 20% of all prisoners on earth. <laughs> It's mind-boggling when you think about it. So, so given any prisoner on, on Earth, a wow. fifth of those are all in the United States, right? It's crazy. But, but changing, changing the problem of bias is barely going to put a dent in that. It's not getting at the core, the fundamental problem. Um, now, when I, yeah. when I ask folks, and I, I ask the same question whether I'm giving a lecture in uh, West Africa or South America or the United States, I ask folks, what do you think the most pressing problems today are? And, and it's interesting how much it varies, right? So if I'm in West Africa and I ask that question, I can guarantee you somebody in the audience is going to say, fix the damn roads. Right. Because these, these huge potholes in the road are, you know, a, a huge problem. You've got this torrential, you know, uh, Devastation. Uh, downpour. Yeah. Right. Well, it's, 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 it's natural. So there's, there's naturally a rainy season. That's just really intense. Mm. And, and probably if, if we had been engineering asphalt roads in that environment from the get-go, we wouldn't have these problems. But you take technology that was made for you know, uh, uh, 
Macadam is what they sometimes call asphalt. That's yeah. because it was it was invented by you know Dr. Macadam, an engineer uh, who was British. So so if you if you take that technology that's been invented elsewhere and you try to import it into a tropical country, of course, you know it's it's not up to the task. So so uh, no surprise there. But generally speaking, the problems always fall into the same three categories. Either you're you're talking about environmental problems, or you're talking about the problems that working folks are having, labor problems, or you're talking about the way that communities are under siege. Right. So so all of these you can think of in terms of uh, the extraction of value. So you're taking value away, right? Yeah. Um, and that's easiest to understand, I think, for nature. So, so this gets at the question you were asking about biodiversity. You know, why do we keep harming our biodiversity? Well, part of the reason is the profit incentive. Right. So if I go into a forest and I do clear cutting, that is super efficient. And I get a big bang for the buck. I get a lot of timber for a small amount of money. But it also is incredibly damaging, right? Right, because you're killing habitats, you're killing uh, ecosystems, you're killing species that depend on those habitats. Yeah, that maybe and, a keystone species might live at, and you're destroying those keystone species, and you're destroying not just one ecosystem but hundreds. Yeah, and and think about not just the biological environment, but also the physical environment. So what's holding the soil in place are the trees, and once you take those trees out, the next big rainfall, all that soil washes away. Oh. Right? And that takes centuries to accumulate. That's not coming back. Oh my um, gosh! Yeah. Now it's 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 a little bit more subtle in the case of something like soil depletion. So you can have this big farming operation. You know, I'm going to put in a million acres of wheat, right? Um, and if you just keep farming that year after year after year, the the fertility of the soil declines, and that's because there's all these little microorganisms that are depending on those nutrients. And that's not being brought back into the, the soil. So the, so the value is being extracted from the ecosystem, right? Yeah. Um, I was listening to a podcast just the other day, and somebody said, well, I don't know why you're talking about extraction. Pollution is putting something into the environment. Yeah, that's true. But think about it in terms of something like heat. So if I want a heat sink in an electric circuit, or I have a big power plant, like a nuclear power plant. I need that waste heat to go somewhere. So it's convenient if I can just, you know, throw that waste heat into the river or into the ocean. But that's going to kill the ecosystem. Waste heat? I've never heard yeah, of that before. Yeah, yeah. So when when you heat up the uh, turbines, so you've, you're, your power plant is generating heat. Either it's coal fired or nuclear fired or gas fired or whatever. It's generating heat. You turn that heat into steam. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, wait, wait, wait. So we we need to. So a power plant is generating energy for us, but it needs energy to generate the energy for us. Um, it needs it needs a difference in heat. So you have to start with it's something a, that's right, right, right. Because the physics, right. right. So that because, yeah, got it. The, the heat the engine, physics, yeah. got it. I got yeah. it. I'm sorry. The thermodynamics, yeah. got it, got it. Yeah. So 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 you you start with steam, but now you've got this stuff that can't go back in um, because now you're going steam to steam, so nothing's going to happen, mm. right? You you you've got to get rid of all that that superheated st steam and all that hot water. Got um, it. And so so that has to either be dumped into the lake or the or the ocean or the river, in which case it kills off the ecosystem. Wow. Or you have to somehow convince that power company, I know you love your high profits, but man, you've got to start spending some money on those cooling towers. You know, those big hourglass shaped cooling towers you see, they weren't always there. They used to just dump that heat right into the, the bodies of water that were nearby. And you would get these giant kill offs and it took a long time for them to, to force companies to say, we're going to bear the cost of that, right? So just like you can use up a forest, you can use up the sink. You can use up the place where stuff goes. And that prevents nature's ability to regenerate. So it's a little bit more complicated in the case of pollution, but it's still extracting a value. It's taking something away from nature that please, nature please. would use to regenerate. Okay. We don't have to do things that way. We could we could have an economy that's based on a circular loop, right? 
So, so in the case of nature, in the case of ecological value, after you're done eating that apple, you can throw that into the compost pile. And that can go back into the soil. And now you're not uh, uh, causing the soil fertility to decline, right? Yeah. You, can have a, you can have a reforesting program where you're only selecting certain trees and planting new ones. And you can nurture that forest in a way that's quite natural, right? Because trees naturally die. There's lightning strikes and all kinds of things. Uh, it's, it's not like it's so delicate that you can't take timber out of it. You just have to do so in a way that's compatible with the ability to regenerate, to, to reestablish itself. And just a right? quick that's, fun fact. Yeah, quick fun yeah. fact. Tree, trees get its nitrogen from lightning. Great point. Great point. Yes. So there's, there's a lot of organisms that are, that are getting that nitrogen out of the air, putting it into the soil and adding to the soil fertility. Right. That's a, that is an, that is an excellent point. So there's there's sort of two ways of looking at economies. If you ask, you know, go go to the economics department at, at UMICH and ask somebody, what does the word value mean? They'll say it's the price. How much are people willing to pay for this? And it might be, you know, how much are you willing to pay for clean water? Right. Mm. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to now force these guys to have the cooling tower. Because that's a price that's too 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 much to pay. But right. that's the that's the view of, of a of a capitalist who's just thinking about it in terms of money. If you think about it in terms of these loops, in terms of regeneration, what I like to call a generative economics, then you have two different kinds of value. You have the kind of value that's still within the loop, like I was talking about compost, right? Or you have the kind of value that's been sucked out, that's been extracted. Yeah. And, and once it gets sucked out, it's hard to put it back again. That's that's the the the, now, the essential lesson here. Now, quick example. Now, how does that work in the actual capitalistic workforce, where you are working constantly and your job is extracting from you? Does that mean you eventually are just going to burn out because either you're in a job that you're not passionate about, so it doesn't come back to you, or is it just like eventually like you know how they say, uh, if you don't leave a job, the job is going to eventually fire you. Is that is that is that is that what it is? It's like uh -huh. no matter what you do, you give back. The system is always going to extract more than you give back to it. I'm so glad I'm on a podcast where they ask all the right questions. Hey. So that, is, that is that is exactly what I, I've got a slide for here. Hey, okay, let's go. <laughs> so, so here you can here you can see I've got my little cubicle farm. Um, and in that cubicle farm, people are looking pretty miserable. It was exactly what you were just describing, but in, in a little cartoon form. Okay. And that's that is that is alienating value from labor. So that depletes workers, just like you can deplete the soil, right? Interesting. Um, and just like you can have a loop, you can have a, a, a generative uh, ecosystem for agriculture. You can have a generative ecosystem for labor. You can have things like communal labor, collaborative labor, worker cooperatives, open source code, right? It, it, can, yeah. it can even exist at a, at a technical level. I can go onto Wikipedia and I can benefit from the labor that people have put into Wikipedia and I can contribute as a Wikipedia contributor. Interesting. Right? Interesting. So you, can, you can establish those, those loops in the same way for labor and you can do it. I'm on a new slide now. You can do it also for society. So I can I can look at something like I got a little picture here of an article that was in CNN um, it titled what it says about us when we want the cook's recipe, but not their humanity. So these are these little web bots that go around scooping up recipes and sticking it on a website so they can, you know, jam a bunch of advertising on there. Oh, my geez. They, they leave behind the stuff that people actually wanted to say, which is the story. You know, here's my grandma. Here's what I remember about this recipe, the humanity part of it. Interesting. Right? So you're, you're alienating that social value. So um, quick question. Do you, yeah. watch, do you watch Shark Tank? Um, I know of it. I haven't watched it. So it's probably like everything that you're not, you know, that we're not for. But there are a lot of people who get like investments from these very like culturally influenced environments right so they said like i went to japan i went to china i went to africa and i was inspired by how they were doing this and i took this and made an idea about it 
Is that what you're talking about? That Not is exactly the- what I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh my gosh, man. Because every time I heard that, I'm just like, you really think you did something that was right for them or right for you? Because <laughs> I don't think you're yeah. giving them that money you about to get from Mark Cuban, you dig? <laughs> yeah, and it would, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be so bad if it was the the Japanese worker or the African worker who said, you know, this has been in my family and now I want to make a business out of it, right? Yeah, you know, at, at least there you have some basis for doing that. Interesting, but but to but to extract that social value. You know, um, Interesting. That's, that that's killing our communities. You can look at something like wow. Walmart, right? So you have a you have a little community that's got all these little mom and pop shops. Great big Walmart comes along, and suddenly nobody's going downtown. All the bargains are over at Walmart, you know, and you see the decline of that downtown. And now there's a bunch of, you know, graffiti, and it doesn't look good, and you just start that cycle of decline, right? Wow. Downhill spiral. So, so the the just like you can have a loop for agriculture and you can have a loop for labor, you can also have a loop for communities. You can have community based economies that that return that value to those communities, right? Yes. So, so in so in all three of these cases, whether you're talking about cycling ecological value or cycling labor value or cycling social value, you've got something that's broken that you know back. Before colonialism in old, old old times, that was that was traditionally there. But over time, we've broken those links. Those cycles no longer um, are working as well. And in some cases, we've even created barriers to prevent the value from cycling back to workers or cycling back to the, the ecosystem. So this is where I think um, some of the technology can come into play is is to act as a kind of prosthetic. You know, if, if somebody's missing a, a, an arm or a kidney or something, you can get a prosthetic kidney or a prosthetic arm. Um, in this case, we need that that prosthesis to reconnect those parts of the ecosystem um, or the labor system or the social system that have become disconnected. So that's what the, the research we're doing is about. So can you talk about your grant, the name of the grant and just the overall, just like the idea and what it what is it that you uh, apply for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this this really started uh, with our work in Africa. Um, we were looking at these fractal structures. Um, so you get these beautiful, you know, shape within a shape within a shape, right? So maybe it's circles inside of circles inside of circles, or rectangles inside of rectangles inside of rectangles, um, or here's the ring of ring of rings. You get you get those beautiful shapes. Um, and at first, I was I was just trying to to model them computationally. Right. I just yeah. wanted to know, is this really a fractal, you know, using that strict mathematical definition of nonlinear scaling? And, and you know, what's a fractal real quick? What's a fractal? Yeah, it's it's a shape that repeats itself at many different scales. OK, so so a, a tree has a branch of a branch of a branch. Right? right. A cloud is a puff of a puff of a puff. Right. So 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 when you look at a city grid, you know, New York City or Barcelona or something, you'll just see a bunch of squares. Right. We've imposed this grid. But it yeah. was, when you look at how nature builds things, it builds it from the bottom up. And you, mm. so you, you, you get those repeating shapes like a, a coral reef or a termite mound or, 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 or uh, shrubs or something. So, so it, was, it was a bit of a surprise seeing that, that you could spot those kinds of fractal patterns in Africa. Um, and at first, I was just trying to make sure my eyes weren't deceiving me that, you know, I could actually measure the fractal dimension, right, run, run the algorithms and make sure this was true. Um, but then I wanted to know why. Right. Uh, and I was, I was fortunate enough to get a, a Fulbright uh, that let me just travel around Africa for a year, just interviewing folks and asking them, you know, so what's going on here? Why are you arranging things this way? Um, and what I found was that underlying these fractal structures was uh, a kind of symbolism and a kind of oh. material practice that was about regeneration whether it was because you're drawing from the ancestors. So, so every, every uh, new group has to go through a kind of spiritual regeneration, right? And, and, and maybe that's, that's every five years you have a new group comes of age. Mm. So these age grade cycles in Africa are a huge ceremony, right? Uh, here we talk about coming of age, like I got my driver's license. Mm. But, but there it's not a one-time Event, yeah. it's, you know, every every five years or every six years, depending on the 
the culture, there's a there's a ceremony. So I go from being a toddler to, mm-hmm. to being an adolescent, being from an adolescent to a teen, from a teen to young adult. And you and you're you're sort of um you're 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 nurtured at each point. So so you're not just abruptly tossed out there, you know, to do your thing. You're you're actually told, well, here's a certain set of obligations and responsibilities you have, but what comes with that, you know, are now the privileges of rank, right? You 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 can now do things that you couldn't do before. And so there's this beautiful mapping between the kind of geometry that you see. So this little uh, village structure I'm showing you here. Yeah. Um, when a child is born in that first iteration of the life cycle, um, you're in the woman's room ca- called the Dago in um, Burkina Faso. Um, and then in, in that next age grade initiation, um, you yeah. can go here as a toddler. Um, and then you become an adolescent and you can go into the village as a whole. You leave your house. Um, and then you go from the village as a whole to you know the larger community and eventually the world yeah but then but then you're getting older right and so you start moving back um so these these stacks of uh, calabashes here you know it's amazing when you think about the size of the fractal starts out with a whole village right so yeah so maybe that's 100 meters and then you get it down to the little homestead here is maybe you know 10 meters and then with within that you're down to structures that are only one meter and, and then a tenth of a meter. So it's just across magnitudes of scale, that consistent scaling. And in the smallest container here is a little little thing called a compia, where the woman of the household keeps her soul. And when she dies, there's a ceremony where they break all of these gourds, these calabashes and pots, and that releases her soul to go off to the, the afterlife, right? But they believe in re- they believe in reincarnation. reincarnation. So when a child is born, the soul comes back, and the whole cycle starts over again. So talk about people who are committed to cycles within cycles within cycles. You know, it was just mind blowing when I started to realize that what the geometry is trying to tell me, what it's what it's saying to to people, um, and so that that links in with mm. a lot of these communal practices, these self organizing practices so that you don't end up with an extracted economy. Um, mm. And in some cases, you know, it's very symbolic, right? So I'd see these spectacular, you know, triangles inside of triangles inside of triangles or shapes within shapes within shapes. Um, but in other cases, it can be very practical. So so here I've got an example of the, um, the kind of uh, biodiversity support that you see in these societies. Uh, this is... Um, Gabriel Boache uh, passed away just a few years ago, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but he gets this this bark boiled down into ink, and that's stamped on a cloth and these symbols like Funtun Funafu. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, as I feed you, I feed myself, right? The twin-headed uh, crocodile. Um, and then the, that bark that has the pigment strained out, that goes back into the sacred forest or into compost. And that biodiversity. The oh, little, wow. Monkeys and birds bring those seeds and they poop out the, the seeds in a little fertilizer packet. Um, and that is where the bark tree grows, grows again. The, the, oh, the body wow. tree. So the oh, whole wow. thing has this way of sustaining biodiversity. Um, now, in Africa, the big thing is fractals, right? But not every indigenous group has fractals as its heritage algorithm. So when I was looking at these um, Native American groups, you know, it took me a while to catch on. Right. But this is on the um, hey, you got a little biodiversity going on there. <laughs> yes, she is. Yes, yes. This is this is the, this is the this is the multi-species podcast. Hey. All right. So 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 we've we've got our, our other uh, companion species here, uh, as my um, uh, uh, doctoral advisor Donna Haraway used to say, um, in the Navajo case, that would be sheep. And so the sheep. Uh, are out there grazing, and uh, they poop out the seeds of the plants that they ate. And so you can see down in the the lower left here, mm-hmm. there's this explosion of biodiversity around the corrals, right? Because the, the it's it's as the sheep were told go out and do a survey of every plant species and bring it back. Um, and so you've got this incredible biodiversity around those sheep grazing areas. And then grandma here uses that when she makes her dyes. 
And so she's dyeing the wool that's from the sheep in all those different colors because of that biodiversity. And that goes back into the weaving again, right? Um, And so so that benefits the the sheep. So the whole thing has a circular uh, cycle, not because of fractals, but because a very different set of, of heritage algorithms. So, so real quickly, let's talk about just the definition of biodiversity, right? So I guess when I'm, obviously we know diversity means different, right? And, but bio means life, right? And the diversity is what provides that life to prosper. So I'm curious to know in your own words, what is, how would you define life and why must we fight for it, right? Because so I'm looking yeah. at this, right? So I'm looking at the sheep. The sheep look like they're living, right? You know, yeah. life, that's living life. They're living, right? Yeah. And therefore I'm looking at the the weaver and she looked like she's living too because she's in some type of zone, right? Because she's making this beautiful, you yeah. know what I'm saying? This beautiful uh, garment. Yeah. So I guess let's, let's kind of deconstruct life. Like what is that? And why yeah. should we fight for that? Yeah. Well, I'm 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 glad that I'm on the podcast where they ask all the right questions. <laughs> I've um, assembled a little team um, to investigate that question, and and the answer we call entropic modulation. Okay. What's um, that? So What's that? so so here's the team. Um, we have. Oh, you know Shonda. Oh. oh yeah. So, I mean, I, I know her with Twitter, but okay, dope. So, so, so we have uh, Reagan Wadalusi. Uh, she's a, a Navajo uh, ecologist, horticulturalist. Um, Abe Babrahane, uh, you might know, very famous uh, Ethiopian computer scientist. Wow. Um, Matthew Fletcher uh, is a, a Native American professor of law um, here at UMish. Um, Audrey Bennett. The most uh, spectacular. Yeah, it's your wife. Yeah, that's my wife. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and and Fran Cortez uh, is in the um, uh, Center for Complex Systems. Uh, so he's our complexity theorist. Cool. Uh, Shonda Shonda is an astrophysicist. Um, Kwame is my grad student. His expertise is in artificial intelligence, uh, and there I am. So lots of different disciplines coming together. Um, from lots of different ethnic backgrounds. Um, and what we were uh, studying is this concept of entropy, which is a, which is a measure for diversity. So if, if I asked you how many different positions do the molecules in gas take, how many different velocities do they take, you'd say uh, it's mind-boggling. Yeah. Right. yeah. right. A liquid is, is a little a little more cohesive and a crystal Moderate. is a crystal is boring there's Rigid. there's no diversity at all right everybody's obeying the same rules right so so if you think about it entropy is going down as you move from a gas to a liquid to a crystal um and the same is true for something like the colors uh, of beadwork or the ethnicities that you see in a school you can measure that diversity with entropy so here's uh, here's a very low uh, entropy bead string, mostly green with just one blue and one red. And here's a high entropy bead string, right? I've got red, blue, and, and green that's that's uh, uh, evenly distributed. And there's even a little uh, uh, calculator I, I made here for folks to play around with it if they just wanted to, to get a, a feel for it. So so uh, chatting nice. with the chatting with the Native American groups here in Michigan, the Anishinaabe, um, who are the, the uh, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, uh, Cree. So um, they've got this interesting practice they do in doing controlled burns. And so what they'll do is they'll go out to a field that's kind of overgrown. They'll burn it, making sure that fire doesn't just spread, right? It's controlled burn. Um, but then after the next rainfall, suddenly all these new plants are coming up. And that was something they observed happening in nature through lightning, Um, but they then adapted it for their own purposes so that they could maximize the biodiversity in areas. So they study study succession pretty much. They study the secondary succession. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and they they realized that if you have upheaval, 
you'll never have that final formation frozen in, right? You'll always have this ongoing biodiversity. Um, and, and so the Anishinaabe techniques for which patch you burn and how often you burn it is quite sophisticated and, and quite complex, right? Interesting. Um, and we even have a little simulation for that so that kids can learn about this uh, in K through 12 classes. And then the Navajo weaving was another case where you saw uh, uh, entropy modulation from a very low entropy that you get in the orderly weaves. Remember those very ordered crystals. So that, that weaving is kind of like a crystal, right? Things are very well organized. So that, that crazy biodiversity out in the field that yeah. you've got. Yeah. And, and so and so like those those Anishinaabe birds, Ooh, yep, yep, you're, yep. you're modulating between the low entropy and the high entropy, right? Back and forth. So it's kind of it's kind of pumping that unalienated value through the system. Okay. Wow. Now it gets to the question you asked. So what is life? And what we realized was that DNA is very low entropy. It's nothing but a code. It's like a crystal. You know, it's it's taking all of your grandiose biodiversity of molecules and condensing it down into this one little one little strand yeah. um, of nucleotides. Um, and then of, of course, once the sperm and egg unite, you gradually get the emergence of enormous, very, very high entropy. Entropy. Extremely diverse. Uh, numbers of biomolecules and bioprocesses that are going on at the subcellular and cellular and intracellular uh, uh, levels, right? So, so life itself is using the same technique that these indigenous groups were using. 